All right, I will go ahead and share my screen. Welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in to learn all about livestock guardian dogs today. As you could tell from my bio, I'm a big dog person. <laughs> Always excited to get to talk about them. All right. There we go. Cool, just getting my screen set up. All right. So using livestock guardian dogs as a livestock protection tool. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about, first off, is a livestock guardian dog, otherwise referred to as LGD, a good fit for your operation? So we'll be going over um, what you should consider in deciding whether or not um, you should get one. Second, I'll be going over how to choose the right puppy. There are quite a few things to consider. And then third, I'll be going over bonding your dog with livestock, taking care of the dog, and then troubleshooting some of the common problems that you may run into. And there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. All right, so first, is an LGD right for you? Well, especially in California, uh, these dogs are really associated with guarding goats and sheep. But I do want to get the plug in there that really livestock guardian dogs can guard anything. Um, it really is up to you for what you want to bond Second. the dog to. So here you can see them working with cattle. Um, they also are being used for pasture poultry in California. And hey, in Australia, they even use them for wild uh, ground nesting birds. So really <laughs> the world is your oyster um, for using these dogs. And they're quite versatile in terms of what operation they can work on. They can be on private land. They can be on public land. They can work on relatively small pastures that are fenced, or they can be on completely open rangeland with no fences at all. They can work well with a herder or without. They're fine being independent, just staying with their livestock. How many would you need? Again, that'll really depend on your operation, the number of animals you have, um, the different season when you need them. So during lambing season, you may need more dogs than the rest of the year. Um, depending upon your terrain, if you're, the habitat where your livestock are living in is really patchy or rough, where there's a lot of cover for potential predators, you may need more dogs than if it's an open grassland where there wouldn't really be any places for um, predators to easily hide. Um, in terms of predator pressure, think about what predators you need to protect against. That'll also contribute to the number of dogs you'll need um, and how effective they may be. In terms of the mechanism for how livestock guardian dogs work, uh, there's still a lot of research to be done. So there's still questions remaining about how much these dogs may be altering the territories of predators versus just affecting the hunting behavior. So just increasing the risk associated with hunting livestock, which then can make uh, predators think twice about doing so. They mostly work by acting as a deterrent. So they'll be marking, making their presence known. So often when you first um, release a livestock guardian dog into a new pasture, they'll immediately be going around and start marking the territory of it. And that's to let predators in the area know that they're now there. They're also going to work by barking. Um, and I'll be getting, mentioning that again later. Um, another way that they're gonna be letting potential predators in the area know about their presence. And hopefully they don't ha actually have to escalate to the point of physically confronting a predator, but that can sometimes happen. Um, and that's something to think through. You know, you never know if there may be a bit of a surprise vet bill if the dog does have to actually confront something uh, to protect the animals. Um, one thing that I often hear people say is that these dogs require specialized training. And I think that's a little bit misleading because in fact, what you need to do is give the space and give the dog the opportunity to do what they've been bred to do for centuries, if not longer. Um, these dogs for so long have been bred for this specific purpose. They're very independent thinkers. They're not gonna sit there and wait for a command to do something. They're not gonna be relying on you or on a herder to tell them what to do. Um, they're going to, once they're bonded to the livestock, they know that their job is to protect them. And so 
perhaps when people say specialized training, they just mean some of you know, the corrections that you may need to do as the puppy matures, but really an adult livestock guardian dog will be very effective um, without any human input at all. Um, another thing that I often hear people concerned about is, are they dangerous? Um, you know, people are concerned, I, I wanna run my sheep on public land where they're recreationists or they're bicyclists. Is this gonna, are these dogs too dangerous to do that? And I like to remind people, you know, these are a dog. Uh, you can have a really vicious golden retriever, right? There's gonna be a lot of individual variation. But if you get a dog from solid parents, if you socialize it, um, there are plenty of livestock guardian dogs I've interacted with that have not been dangerous whatsoever. Um, I've been on public land where there have been LGDs working with sheep and I've had my own dog with me off leash. And as long as I didn't get really close to the sheep, which really you shouldn't be doing anyways, the dogs completely ignored my dog. Um, my colleague, Dan Macon, who you're lucky enough to get to hear from um, in the next talk, when I went with Dan into the, his uh, sheep pasture, the dogs came right up, um, wanted, you know, wanted me to pet them or very friendly. It would probably have been different if I, by myself without Dan, climbed the fence and went into the ship pasture, but really I shouldn't have been doing that anyways. Um, so really these dogs, I think, maybe sometimes get a bad rap um, about their aggression most of them are not going to be, they're gonna be very safe with people as long as you take you know, whatever precautions you would when you get a normal pet in terms of socializing. All right, so back to barking, keep in mind that that is a really big way that these LGDs are gonna work in letting predators know about their presence. And I really wanna highlight that because you wanna think about how close your neighbors are in thinking about should you get an LGD. Um, so for some people who, you know, may have a few goats in their yard and they live on the edge of suburbs, or their neighbors are very close, your neighborhood may not be happy if you get an LGD that's going to bark all night because there are coyotes around. Um, so keep that in mind. There may, you may need another tool um, if the barking is really going to be an issue um, because that is the reality of having these dogs. Um, consider cost. So you're going to have an upfront cost of purchasing them, but of course you're gonna have recurring costs every year. Um, people I've spoken with in California, their costs typically were between three and $400 a year per dog um, for vet bills and uh, feed, but you never know if you're gonna have a surprise vet bill, right? So that it, it is a responsibility you're taking on if you choose to get one of these dogs. And of course there's the time uh, for caring for them, for feeding them, um, you know, they're not negligible. So consider that in making your decision. And then when I say time, I mean, if you're gonna get a puppy, be aware that it's gonna take between 18 and 24 months for that puppy to reach maturity and be effective. Um, so if you're having really severe livestock losses right now, um, if you get a puppy, it's going to be a while before um, the dog's going to be effective. So you may need to either look at another tool um, or some people do get adult livestock guardian dogs. I've personally heard very mixed reviews for that. Um, I know a few people where it's worked great for them, given that was a fenced pasture um, and the dog had already been bonded to that type of livestock. I've also spoken with people where the adult dog just didn't work out. So really do your research. Um, if you're interested in adult dog, see what kind of guarantee the breeder offers. Um, do you know that typically dogs are gonna be more effective if you get them as puppy and bond puppies and bond them to your own livestock? All right, so if you've decided, yes, LGD, this is the right move for me, how should you go about choosing the right puppy? Well, first off, you're gonna to need to decide what breed you want. And there are a lot of options out there. So there are many breeds um, that originated in Europe and Asia um, that have since been imported into the US. Some of the more common breeds you may have heard of are gonna be Great Pyrenees, there in the middle, um, Anatolian Shepherd on the lower left. We have Maremma, as well as Akbosh, which is another white breed not shown here. Um, some of the newer breeds to the US are gonna be Karakachan, shown here on the upper left, 
a Kangle on the upper right there. Those are the ones that um, I've it's worked exactly. with. So as well as crosses between breeds. And that's very common in the US to see. Um, oftentimes they're called white dogs um, because LGDs are typically large and white. Um, and that's something that you'll often come across. Now, research has shown that there's as much variation between dogs as there is between breeds. While there's been one study that did show a few purebred breeds or purebred dogs um, being more effective as crosses, in general, there's such variation that really um, the most important thing I think is buying a puppy from working parents. And that's probably gonna give you a better sense um, of what your puppy is gonna grow up to be like than just looking at the breed itself or whether it's a cross or not. Another benefit if you buy a puppy from working parents, not only can you get a sense of how the parents are in terms of their, um, how effective they are protecting livestock and potential challenges um, that operator has run into, but ideally those puppies are being exposed to livestock, especially ideally, hopefully the type of livestock you're gonna be using the dog with, um, but really any livestock is better than none. The dog, puppies, you know, from a really early age, you want to start that bonding. And so if they're already being born out in a pasture, or out in a barn, that really is ideal. Um, and the dogs, they're smelling livestock, they're hearing livestock right from the moment they're born. Um, they're getting used to some farm equipment, kind of the noise of operations, that sort of thing. Now, should you get a male or a female? Research has shown they're both going to be equally as effective as guard dogs. So a lot of it will come down to your personal preference and what other dogs you have on the operation. Um, and also think through if you're going to keep your LGD intact or spay or neuter it. Um, of course, if you have an intact male LGD and you also have a female herding dog that's intact, your LGD may become quite distracted when you're herding dogs in season and vice versa. If you have an intact um, female LGD, she also may be a little bit more distracted when she's in season, certainly more distracted if she's raising puppies. Um, think through if you're going to have multiple LGDs, you know, two intact males may be a bit more likely to fight than if they're both neutered or having a male and a female. So think you know, longer term about what your plans may be for that. Um, some people also find that intact male dogs have a tendency to be more uh, dog aggressive, which can be a problem if you have you know, herding dogs or other dogs on your operation, but conversely can be a benefit if you're trying to protect your livestock against wolves. So pros and cons with that. Should you get one puppy or two? Um, People also have their own opinions on this. This hasn't been widely studied, so it's largely anecdotal at this point. Um, so there's a pros and cons to each approach. So people argue that if you get two puppies, then maybe they'll be more likely to take out that playful energy that puppies have um, with each other versus taking out that um, energy on your livestock. On the other hand, other people say if you get one puppy instead of two, um, that single puppy may be more likely to bond with the livestock more readily um, because that's all it has to interact with. So again, think through, do you want one? Do you want two? Um, you know, twice as expensive if you get two. There's no one right answer here. Now again, with puppy temperament, there's a lot of variation among dogs and there isn't really a clear cut personality um, that you can test for at eight weeks old, which then will predict how effective a livestock guardian dog will be as an adult. But anecdotally, there are some traits that may increase the odds um, that the puppy will grow up to be what you're looking for. In general, you want your, the livestock guardian dog puppy to be submissive. And either they'll naturally be this, or you may have to do some training to get them to be submissive. Um, this photo is an example of a behavior you're looking for. This is the dog being submissive to livestock, licking the face. That's, a, that's good. Um, that is showing them they're being very submissive. Another thing to look for would be the puppy slowly walking up to livestock or crawling up to them. You don't want them barreling up to livestock, which will potentially spook them. 
Uh, you don't want your LGD puppy to have really high prey drive. They're not meant to be retrievers. Um, so if you throw a ball or a toy, you're not looking for them to run and grab it and bring it back to you. They might be, you know, they'll be interested in it, but they shouldn't be overly excited about that. You want your LGD puppy ideally to be calm, right? You don't want them upsetting the livestock, but at the same time, you want them to be alert. So these dogs should be curious about something that is new or suspicious. They shouldn't just accept it. Um, they should be curious. They should go up to it, investigate it. Um, you know, they should bark if it's something really scary and potentially very new. And for barking, never punish an LGD puppy for barking, even if you know what they're barking at isn't actually a threat. That's because as the dog matures, they'll be able to have that sense um, of what is a true threat versus not. And they'll on their own be able to figure out what they actually need to bark at. But in general, you want them to be letting you know or the livestock know um, or the predator know that the dog is there. So barking is a good thing, which I know is different for uh, most other dogs you may get. All right, so I have a puppy, now what do I do? And that is where please begin the bonding process immediately. Bonding your dog to livestock is gonna be the most important thing you can do as an LGD owner, because that's really gonna have the biggest impact on how well the dog um, will do its job. So the earlier you can start bonding the puppy to livestock, the better. Um, really by eight weeks, you wanna have the dog in with livestock. So if the breeder, you know, had the dog or had the puppies whelped with livestock, puppies have been with them from the beginning and you're a first time LGD owner, um, some breeders will be willing to keep the dog an extra few weeks and start this bonding process where they are at. Um, however, if you, if the puppy has not been born with livestock, I would strongly recommend picking that puppy up right at eight weeks and immediately putting it in with some of your livestock. Um, the earlier you start this process, the better. Um, and once the puppy, you know, is older, gosh, probably past 16 weeks, you can't really go back and do this bonding process. It'll be too late. So earlier, the better. Um, but do be cognizant of which livestock you're placing the puppy with. You want to set the puppy up for success. Lambs or kids, which are going to be playful and can't protect themselves from a puppy. You do want to put the puppy in with you know, an older individual livestock who won't put up with the puppy being annoying or chasing them, but also isn't going to injure the puppy. Um, so if you're going to be bonding the dog with cattle, um, people recommend putting it in with either calves or replacement, a few, few replacement heifers. Um, I've used you know, older sheep that have known dogs and kind of known how to correct them. Um, so take into account individual personality of your livestock as well for figuring out who to place with the puppy. Now, if possible, I would also recommend having um, the pen that the puppy's in be closer to home just so it's easier for you to check on the puppy. And you know, you can quickly catch if the dog's doing anything wrong, like rough playing with livestock, which I'll get to in a troubleshooting problems, um, but things that you may need to correct. If you do have the dog in with calves, um, I would re also recommend having there be a place where the dog can escape the calves, just as it's kind of getting the lay of the land while it's still quite small. Um, but really just have the puppy in with livestock all the time. And I know it can be really hard, right? These, these dogs are adorable. You'll wanna snuggle with them, you'll wanna take them home, but really that's not setting the dog up for success. It should be spending a majority of its time out with the livestock. And these breeds are bred to be able to be um, you know, outdoors all the time. But that being said, you don't want the dog to be feral. Um, so there, you need some human socialization, just don't overdo it. And honestly, just a few minutes a day when you're feeding the puppy, you can do a quick once over to make sure, you know, it's healthy and all, um, that'll be enough for it to become comfortable with people. You want it to be spending significantly more time with the livestock than with humans. Um, but getting them used to some human touch, being around you, your vet will certainly thank you. Um, and it'll make it easier if you do have to ever treat them or um, you know, they have a wound, take care of them. 
Also expose your puppy to anything it's going to be experiencing. So if your livestock are going to be grazing on public land where there are a lot of mountain bikers or next to a county road where there are cyclists every weekend, introduce the puppy to bicycles, right? You want to teach them that bicycles aren't a threat. They don't need to be barking or chasing um, when they see one. Expose the puppy to riding in a truck. If you're gonna be moving your livestock around regularly and needing to be in a truck is something that the dog's gonna to have to be used to, introduce that to them when they're quite young and when they're not so big, because right, these dogs get to be you know, 80 to over 110 pounds. So getting a unsure 30 pound puppy into a truck is gonna be a lot easier than trying to wrangle a 100 pound dog that isn't comfortable being in a truck. Also expose the puppy to other dogs in the operation. Um, get them used to the herding dogs that you'll be using. Teach the puppy to respect fences. Um, really, whatever that first pen is that you put the puppy in, make sure the puppy can't escape. You don't want them to learn that escaping, getting over a fence is even an option. Um, so if you're gonna be having them in with an electric fence, introduce that to them young. They'll learn quite quickly. Um, they need to respect that fence. care. So in terms of grooming, really minimal. Um, these dogs are bred to be left outdoors all year round. Um, there's some variation in coat length between the breeds. So I mean, Anatolian Shepherds and Kangles, their coats really didn't require anything. Um, Great Pyrenees do have longer coats, so you may need to cut out some mats. Um, that's just going to be something you'll want to check um, and make sure they're not going to get a hot spot or something like that. Um, flea and tick medicine, depending upon where your operation is. Um, of course, you know, when the puppy's eight weeks old, do be cognizant of parvo. Um, they'll need all the same vaccines as a, um, any other dog would need. But that's where having uh, the puppy closer to home can sometimes be a bit safer than putting them out um, in a faraway pasture. In terms of feeding, uh, you can either hand feed them every day. But if you're someone who doesn't see your livestock every day, but maybe every other day, um, there are ad automatic feeders out there that you can use, um, which you know can even go multiple days feeding the dog on its own at a set uh, time. I would recommend feeding the dog um, near the livestock. So don't feed them at your house or at the barn. You don't wanna be encouraging the dog to be leaving the livestock um, and they are still dogs. So. You know, if you have the set time that you feed them every day, they'll show up at that time, you know, so you don't want them five o'clock every day being at the barn instead of out with the livestock. All right, and then troubleshooting problems. So as effective as livestock guardian dogs have uh, been shown to be, and they are a really great tool that's available, um, it's not always this idyllic scene where, you know, the sheep are safely grazing and the dog is amongst them so well hidden you can't even see where they are. Um, these are dogs, they're individuals. Uh, there may be some issues that you'll need to be prepared for uh, as they mature. So first off is roaming. Um, sorry that this is not an LGD photo, but I thought it got a point, the point across. Um, this is perhaps the biggest complaint you'll hear about LGDs where they can roam or they're jumping the fence. So if an adult dog is doing this and it's really just not being contained by the fences and is regularly roaming, that typically gets back to a bonding issue. They're just not well bonded enough. Um, a dog that is properly bonded to its livestock doesn't need a fence. So even if the fence breaks, the dog will choose to stay with the livestock. And if the fence breaks and the livestock leave, the dog will go with them. Um, that's the sign of a truly well-bonded dog. But, you know, as the puppy is maturing, they are still forming that bonding bond with them. Um, they may be more likely to you know, go and explore a little bit and roam or not respect the fences. So what can you do about that to try to teach the dog not to do this negative behavior? So that's where you can use what's called uh, a dangle stick, which in this case, it's a pipe with a chain. Um, you can also use just a long stick with a rope, but the idea is um, that you hang it from the front of the collar at a height just below the dog's knee so that when the dog goes to run or it goes to jump, its front leg is gonna hit it and just gonna kind of be a barrier and inhibit its movement and be annoying. Um, and this 
pretty quickly will teach the dog not to jump or not to be running. Uh, you can also use this if the dog is chasing livestock just because it slows it down and inhibits their movement. Um, if the dog's really climbing through fences, you can also try what's called a yoke. So you can just like put pieces of wood out <laughs> um, so that the dog gets caught as it tries to go through the fence. Another way to teach it that that's not appropriate behavior. Um, playing with livestock can also be an issue as the dog is maturing before it really you know, has matured into an adult. So from this photo, unfortunately that sheep on the right is not some earless breed, but rather um, lost its ears to a young LGD who thought it was quite fun to grab at the ears. So this can happen and this is where, you know, being on top of what the dog's doing correcting them immediately if you see any kind of playing or grabbing behavior that the puppy's doing. Um, you may need to put the puppy in with different individual animals that are a bit bigger um, and can better defend themselves. If it's lambing season, I wouldn't put an immature dog in with the sheep. Um, same with kidding season. Don't put them in with the goats. You may just have to put them into a different pen during that season until the dog has proven itself trustworthy. And that's again, we're having the patience and knowing that it's gonna take you know, up to two years for that dog to fully mature. You may not be fully able to trust that dog for the first few years. And that's just something to uh, be aware of going into it. So overall, uh, LGDs are a great tool in our toolbox. And I think there's a lot of room for using them in more situations in California and beyond. Um, they're not perfect no uh, real deterrent is, right? But they can be highly effective. Um, do your research, make sure you talk to the breeder, um, make sure that the parents of the whatever puppy you're getting have the traits that you would want um, and be ready to be patient and be creative in troubleshooting potential issues. Um, I'm always here as a resource, so is Dan Macon. Um, so if you ever have any questions, we're happy to help brainstorm how to address them. That's it. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned something today. And does anyone have any questions? Carolyn, we have two and a half minutes. Thanks, Carolyn. That was a really awesome, comprehensive um, review of guard dogs um, and their, their use and things to consider. I wish I had uh, heard this before I got into my first guard dogs, because I can tell you that I uh, bought an adult guard dog named Snuggles. And um, that should have been the clue right there, but um, he's no longer a guard dog. He is now a lap dog with a friend in Colorado. So um, I guess a quick question um, that I have is on the roaming. Um, I've heard before that there might be a difference in different breeds and their propensity to roam. Is that true in your experience or is it really just the bonding as the primary factor? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I find such variation even talking to breeders about what they think. My own experience has really been that it comes down to bonding. And that's where some breeders will be like, oh, well, this breed bonds better. And that's why they don't roam, whether that's true or not. I, I think it comes down to bonding. And, and that should be a question you should ask any potential breeder is, do they have a problem with roaming? Um, and if you go to visit their property, see, do the adult dogs have a drag stick? Do the adult dogs have a yoke, right? That can give you a sign that they're having an issue with that. Um, and that is something to be considered. I think that's where, oh, I forgot to mention or to really highlight getting a puppy if it is a cross between two LGD breeds, um, really avoiding uh, a puppy where one of the parents is not an LGD breed because that'll they're just not gonna bond as well. And that'll really increase your chances of having a roaming problem. I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, one, is there anything that you would consider a minimum size fencing uh, or fenced area for a breed like that? That's a great question. Um, <coughs> technically, no. I, I know people who have them and have you know, an acre and the dog's fine. I think it's more thinking through if it is a really small space do you need an LGD or is it potentially cheaper to just build a better fence or having the fence be electrified depending on what your predators are? Um, these dogs, 
if it's too small of a space, I could see them so maybe potential for getting bored. Um, but I've known dogs that have been in an acre and they've been perfectly content. I mean, these aren't high energy dogs that need a ton of exercise. Um, so I think not really, just think through if you really need an LGD, if it's such a small space. And question. Oh, oh uh, sorry. A quick second question. What's a reasonable price for a puppy? Good one. So I've heard a lot of people spending $500 or less um, on puppies. But then I've also seen some of these purebreds going for, you know, a thousand. So there's a big range. Um, again, just see kind of what your budget is, how far you're willing to travel. Um, there is a really big range, but you can get a dog for fairly inexpensive for, you know, 500 or less. Yeah, question about resources. Are there any directory, breed dog directories? Are there, um, is it just searching um, LGDs or what? Oh, great question. Uh, I don't know if one directory, if you're interested in a particular breed, each breed will have like a club and they'll have a list of their own breeders. Right. Um, right. But mostly I'd go by like word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have a few LGDs that they also happen to breed, you know, once a year, once every few years. Um, right. You could try your local, you know, Cattlemen's Association, Sheep Growers sheep, or right. Association. That'd probably right. be the best bet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Carolyn, again so much.